Welcome to another episode of the Burnout Expert Podcast. I am absolutely excited to introduce this guest to you. When we started talking and she started giving me her burnout story, there were so many parallels to mine. Her burnout crash was from something very similar to mine. And some of the blocks she had after her burnout were the same as mine. And I've not heard anybody speak of this publicly. So I am super excited to get this out to you because many of you are fit and healthy and want to be working out. And that is your identity. And when burnout hits you, it, it swipes you under the rug. So without further ado, let's introduce you to Lex Vuko. Now she is known as Herculex and she's a highly accomplished fitness and business expert with over 20 years of experience in sports such as boxing, kickboxing, and bodybuilding, which interestingly led her to part of her burnout story and how she transformed her business and the way that she works with her clients. Her unique combination of physical training, mental and emotional techniques, and nutritional knowledge sets her apart from all of the competition. Lex has successfully built and run a high six-figure fitness studio, working with clients from extreme sport athletes to business owners and entrepreneurs. Her proprietary program contains the right combination of biohacking and neurohacking methods, fitness training, meditation, mindset training, and emotional intelligent work that really helps individuals push past their mental boundaries, become more resilient, and optimize their daily performance. Lex's revolutionary system has been featured on CBS, Fox, US Daily Ledger, and she has received recognition for the fastest growing business in the health and fitness industry. Now, you know how many people are in, how many businesses are in the health and fitness industry. So that is huge to be recognized as the fastest growing business. Lex also co-wrote a book, a bestseller called The Fad Diet with like-minded fitness trainers around the USA. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Lex. Hey, thanks for having me. That bio sounds amazing. It's like if I was hearing this about someone else, I'd be like, that's cool. It's just one of those moments when you're like, oh, is that me? That's, that's pretty cool. cool. <laughs> yeah, no. It. And the thing is, is I had to take some things out. Right. You have so much behind you and in your history and your knowledge. And that's why we need to have you here today. So you. your burnout story is, it, it is one that really touched my heart. The thing is, is let's actually, I'm going to go about this a little bit backwards Normally, I would get somebody to tell me a little bit leading up to their burnout story in a sense, but I'd like you to talk about the actual burnout, okay. and then we're going to talk about all of the things before that. Okay. So you could start with letting us know what it was that, that had the huge burnout crash. I think one of the things to first say is it's so hard for people to admit they're going through a burnout. It is. Because we're hustlers, we're go-getters. You know, I identify with words like grit and drive and ambition, right? So for someone like me to be like, no, I'm actually fucking burnt out. Like, it's really hard to admit that because we find that as a defeat of myself, right? Like, I have failed me. And I think that's why it's under talked about is because there's so much guilt and shame in it. So I will just say what happened to me is I finally admitted to myself that I, I actually remember this very moment. I was taking my stuff from the washer to the dryer. Well, I was supposed to take my stuff from the washer to the dryer. And I thought, oh, my God, I don't know if I have energy for this. And I caught myself. I thought, who thinks like this? This is taking stuff from the washer to the dryer. It's literally right next to each other. You're in the fitness field. And I was in the fitness field. And I, I was like, that. I'm the one working out. Looking yeah. at stairs and going, how am I going to get up these stairs? Yes. I remember. It's so, like, it's so silly because I'm like, I'm the trainer. Why is it so hard for me to take this stuff and put in a dryer? And I thought there's something very wrong with me right now. And I didn't know if it was mental, emotional, physical, like I had no idea what was going on. 
But that was the first moment that I went, something is really wrong. And I went to the doctor and I was like 32 or 33. And he said, oh, that's difference between 30s and 20s. After I told him the story about the washing and drying, I'm like, no, Mm. dude, if I was 90, you could pull that off. But this is not 30s. Like, I'm not supposed to have a hard time doing the most basic task ever. And I started, that's when I started my research on thyroid. And I I went to another doctor who took all my hormonal levels and my thyroid was hypoactive. It was hardly even functioning. My testosterone was zero. So for those listening, can you explain a little more about the thyroid in case they don't know? Right. So you have hypo, which is underactive and you have hyper, which is overactive. Typically when people have hypoactivity, they feel sluggish, they feel tired, they feel drained they have hard time taking stuff from the washer to the dryer they have you know we think it's thoughts but it's actually your body sending you signals like this is taking a lot of energy so hypoactive gland is a very sluggish gland that it 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 just affects really everything including your thoughts and for me again it it was just energy level was just zero and then he took thyroid or he took a hormonal test my testosterone which by the way females have testosterone need to have testosterone my testosterone level in the body was zero. It was literally zero, like nothing. And so that at least was the first step forward to get the answers. So he put me on a medication for thyroid and I'm not the type of person that likes medication. So right away I thought, I asked him, I said, why are people having thyroid issues? And he said, I don't know, so many people have, and that's not good enough. I don't know. Yeah, he said, I don't know that so many people have the issues. It could be, and then he named, you know, the pollution, the lifestyle. He named like a bunch of things. And I thought, that's not good enough for me. I'm not going to stay on medication forever. So I started doing a th- for thorough research on thyroid and realized that iodine, for example, is absolutely essential for the function of thyroid. But most people don't tell you that or don't know that. And the cop out is, oh, you're using um, iodinized salt. No, that salt is crap. Actually, you need sea salt or Himalayan salt. But let's get back on track. So then he gave me, gave me a cream for testosterone or it was drops. What I liked about this partic- particular doctor is he said, these are the levels where it should be. But he said, don't pay attention so much to that. Pay more attention to how you're feeling. So he said, add another drop every two weeks till you start feeling more normal. And I love that because it was very slow. It wasn't like add a drop a day, right? It was very slow, gradual, and it allowed me to check in with me. Now, mind you, I was already in fitness. I'm very in tune with my body and what my body is selling me. So it took me a long time to get to the levels where I felt normal again. With all of that, I went through a, a, a refeeding syndrome, which is binging disorder. Basically, if you're uh, for those who got really, really low on body fat percentage and the body is basically not giving you any other option, but to just think about food all the time. And the moment you have food in front of you, you literally cannot control yourself. So I went through a binging process for there for a while and a couple of things that sorted that out were I allowed myself to binge, but only on healthy foods that are in my house, which is like spinach, chicken, stuff like that. You help us understand a little bit of the difference between that and an eating disorder, or yeah. are they in the same? They very much overlap. Um, but when you do anything drastic with your body, your body is going to react and you're going to have consequences. Yeah. So people want this fast weight loss. They want this fast body transformation. Everybody wants to lean out and tone up. Everybody does because we, we want that look. However, anything drastic is uh, comes with a hefty price. There's something called weight set point, which is a set point that your body is comfortable with. You don't easily gain or lose weight from that point. This is why people say the weight creeped on because you slowly gained a pound, then you slowly gained another pound and the weight set point has reset itself. And that's the comfort of your own body. Now, if I go on a strict diet and I lose weight really quickly, the body strives to go back to the weight set point and then add a few more pounds to that to make sure you have enough body fat on you. So when I was competing in bodybuilding, I had to drop my body fat to a very low percentage so that the muscles are showing, they're popping, but that's extremely dangerous for the body. And of course, it's done very relatively quickly within two or three months, which is very quickly for the body to go that low in body fat percentage. 
also for female well everybody needs to have a certain body fat percentage in their body but especially females we need a little bit of a higher body fat percentage when you go really low which you do for competitions that's when your body is like freaking out and trying to get you back on track the only thing you can think about is food because food is so primary to the body and all of the girls that competed with me and I would admit that we would go on Instagram and do like the food porn thing. We would literally just scroll over the pictures of the food that we're going to eat. Yeah. So that's what I really wanted to dive into was this bodybuilding piece of this, because that is the, it's, it's the full on overtraining, under eating, all of that. So where does this bodybuilding piece fit into this not being able to get the laundry in? Did it happen before the yep. laundry or after the laundry? Oh, before the whole yes. thyroid, testosterone issues, binging, it was all due to the bodybuilding competition. This is what I would love to dive into yeah. is this part of this burnout. So, yeah. so for those that are listening, um, Vex was competing in bodybuilding competitions. So can you tell us how long did you compete for? How many years? Well, let me backtrack that. I actually wanted to do just one at first because yes. I was going through a grieving process of my mom and I wanted to do something that was bigger than me, something to focus on. I heard someone doing that in, in a running world and I'm like, I'm not going to run, but let me go ahead and put some more muscle on and I can compete. So the idea was to do something that's bigger than me. Well, on that first competition, I got second place and I was like, oh, so close. No, no, no. I got to do this again. So you do have the season. So you, you go through a season of which is refeeding and gaining a little bit more muscle working in your body. And then the next season, you also start leaning out. And so the next time I came back, I um, wanting to do, I can't remember if it was two or three of them and they were close one to another. Mm -hmm. So my body was going through a drastic weight loss, body fat loss, um, increased training. Mind you, I was still running my studio and I was not getting adequate sleep because I'm a night owl by nature, but I had to be at the studio at 5 a.m. And now with all the overtraining, under eating, and then now you add lack of sleep, it's like a cocktail for a disaster, which most people don't really realize they're not getting proper sleep, whether they think that or not. No. And this is all what I really wanted to dive into because you and I were in the fitness field and we thought, well, I thought, I'm not going to put words into your mouth. I thought that this was actually something healthy because that's what we're fed. We're fed okay. by people that this is healthy, that there is a healthy way to do this. I know for me, and I don't actually often talk about when I did fitness competitions. I was not, I don't know. I did fitness because it wasn't as much of bulking up and that was like too hard for my body shape. But I, I, once I started getting into some that were like with people from the States and they're all into all this cheerleading and all this acrobatics or dance, I'm like, whoa, I was out of my league. And it was quite embarrassing to say the least. Um, but when I did my first competition, I was like, whoa, this wasn't healthy. What the heck are they talking about? I'm like, I'm going to get a coach. I'm going to get a different coach and I'm going to get this different coach that trains healthy and natural. And I yep. interviewed a bunch of different coaches and I had this one that said, yes, I can. Yes, I can. And I'm going through it with her. And I'm like, wait, this still isn't healthy. Yeah. Like what the heck? And it was the third one that I started training for that I actually I was trying to do it on my own with all of my background and training and going, how can I do this in a healthy way? I was like, I can't. And my body was crashing yeah, yeah. then as well. So what is your experience as well? Being from somebody with all of this training, you're, you're running a studio, hiring trainers, training trainers, like your knowledge is unbelievable in the training industry and that, and that, and with all that we're taught. And then the advertising or the marketing for this is that this is like the epitome of health yeah. where did you um how did you find it from a health standpoint i'm and getting goosebumps which is just by you talking about this like i'm getting mad just right yeah. now um first thing it, you know i, I want to tell all the listeners get away from instagram shitstagram yes. And get away from all these images that you think you should look like. You think these images are inspiring you. But let me tell you something. 
we take pictures when we're competing right before our competition when we look the best and with a lot has to do with a professional and photographer the other angles and <laughs> angles and the right lighting and all of that has to do with the image you see and then you think oh, I should do that. And then that person is like, oh, here's my meal plan. I'm going to give you my meal plan and you can do that. No, look, you want to do that here. I'll give you a meal plan five days a week, five times a day, eat chicken breast and asparagus and you're going to get there. But you're also going to get there with um, mental and emotional and physical. spiritual price, right? You're going to feel like, I mean, I was a, I was a wreck mentally and emotionally. I was too. I, I, I remember days, my brain being so foggy, I couldn't yep. think. So yeah. So with this, what I really want people to see is this is the extreme dieting yes. and this is the extreme exercise. Yes. And so when we're doing anything to an extreme, when we're doing anything that is too much, our bodies can't handle it, even no. though Technically, all of the foods we were eating are like the healthiest, cleanest foods of all healthiest, cleanest foods. Yes. And all of the exercises we're doing are all of like the best ones to really be working your muscles and doing all your things. But pushing anything to an extreme is not good for your body. A stress so is enough. a stress. Well, there's something called healthy stress and then there's yes. a mess, right? So for example... I'll give you a metaphor. If you plant a small tree, right? And you constantly have some wind blowing at it, that tree is going to produce bigger, thicker roots so that it gets stronger. That's a healthy stress. But if a tornado goes by, that tree is not standing a chance, okay? So that's what we're talking about here. We're all, all beings of this world are designed for short-term stress, not for long-term stress. So if you look at, a um, deer in nature, right? It's going to get stressed when someone or something is chasing it, but then it goes back to grazing the grass. It's going back to normal. And it does that shake to get the cortisol out, which our yep. bodies don't do either. Exactly. So we're not meant for long-term stress. We live in a day and age when people don't have so much stress, they don't even recognize the amount of stress. Right. So let's get let's get back to the healthy stress and comparing that to training and eating, right? So if I put a little bit of stress on my body through either fasting or challenging my body through workouts or what I'm doing right now is just observing what's the ideal thing for my body, that's the healthy stress that I can handle. Bodies love the amount of health, the small amounts of stress that it can recover from, mm -hmm. recover from. When you put your body through something like we did, two or three months of extreme dieting, extreme training, not only that that's like a tornado for your body, but people don't understand that our relationship with food is absolutely primal to us and it's necessary for our survival. Therefore, you will never win over what's been wired in your brain and your body when it comes to food. This is why people go through the refeeding syndrome. And this is why I was such an emotional and mental wreck because I thought I'm already a trainer. I already know what I'm doing. I have the willpower. I have the knowledge. Why can't I stop eating? It's because our relationship with food goes way deeper than just this is nutrition or this is calories and then I need to eat that. It's a very complex relationship. This is why messing with it on that extreme level will never work. And no matter what the amount of willpower you have, you will not win that. No. And like the thing from this all is that a lot of things that we think we're doing healthy or doing too much of something. So if anything can throw off this stress balance. So for you and I, it was the overeating, the overexercising, under eating. Yeah. And that was my first burnout crash. But the but at the same time, we have all of these other stressors as well. I mean, you were running a business. You're working so many hours. We have people in business and entrepreneurs and first responders that are working crazy hours with crazy demands on them that a stress is a stress. And we have to make sure in that time that our bodies can handle the extra stress we're putting on it. So if you are working a 12 hour shift, a 24 hour shift that was really busy, physically taxing, um, 
or you're at a desk job that even mentally you're working on projects, you're dealing with contracts, you're doing all your payroll and all of these things, if you're owning a business and those mental stressors add up just as much as the physical ones do that what you then do for your workout is really going to be determined based on your stress that your body took on in the day and how much reserves you have left for more stress. Yeah, you said that perfectly. And that's why I stepped into what I call optimal performance. I don't call it peak peak performance because people think that's just productivity. No, optimal performance is when you are running on your own absolute best. Mm -hmm. And that goes with nutrition, sleep, hydration, but it goes with the mental and emotional well-being too. Because you, you nailed it. Like you have to recover from that stress. How that's going to be, that's going to be different individual and that's going to differ on the season of life and other things you're dealing with. And, and absolutely all of those things work together. You can't just isolate your nutrition and your training and say that has no impact on my life. No, everything is connected. And there's a reason why when we go low carb or low calorie, our body is making us um, what we call hangry, hungry and angry, right? There's a reason for that. We're not supposed to be like that. Nothing drastic will ever work well for your body. And there's all these people out there that I see that are like, you know, you got to work long hours, like for business owners, you know, like you got to work 20 hour days for years and you got, no, that's bullshit. That's bullshit. You have to get the proper amount of sleep because you will be actually able to do more work in less time when your brain is running at an optimal level. And our brain is very sensitive to whether we're fasting, whether we're getting food, what kind of food we're getting. And that's very individual. Like you have to observe your body. You have to really get in tune with your body to say, for one, why am I doing this, right? Well, why am I competing or why do I want to have a six pack? And is it for the right reasons? And two, is that really optimal for my body? Because I want to be thriving mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually, not just physically, and then disregard the other areas of my life. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't do anything. I would come home, hardly get up the stairs and sit on my couch and just wait until it was a decent hour to try to go to bed. Like it, it, you don't have a life. After that, when you are so burnt out, when your body is so crashed out and that sleep is so important for the reparative stage. But as you said, too, when your hormones are completely tanked, your stress system manages 50 different hormone responses. So you were speaking of your testosterone and, oh, your thyroid you were speaking of. Um, All of these are managed by your stress system, your cognitive thinking, brain, healing and inflammation, your moods, your um, cholesterol, blood pressure, blood glucose regulations. All of these are all regulated by your stress system. And it's you may even be somebody if you're sleeping and you're like, okay, I am sleeping, though, but I'm still waking up with an absolutely empty tank my battery did not charge then that is where we need to be diving deeper as to why is the sleep that you're having not repairing you and healing you why are you not getting to proper deep why are you not getting into proper REM sleep for your body to heal with the deep for your brain to heal with the REM sleep like why and that's where you started diving into some of the hormonal aspects of that yeah. Yeah. So along with that too did you have gut issues as well did, did gut affect you at all Actually, no, that didn't happen. And I think actually that's one good thing about actually eating clean food is yeah. you are getting the the fiber and the, pro- I mean, you overeat protein. I mean, everybody's like, oh, you need protein. You don't eat that much protein, first of all. You can't digest. But they just don't know what to tell you, right? Like they're like, you have proteins, carbs, and fats. And they're telling you not to eat the carbs, but they can't quite tell you to eat the fats. So they're like, well, just eat more protein. No, that's not the solution. You have to know your body. And everybody's different because our ancestors are different and our body went through millions of years of evolution. So everybody is different based on where they come from, right? Another note on sleep. One of the things that your body is never gonna allow you to do is have deep sleep when you're high stress. Because think about this, when you're high stress for the evolution sake, that would mean you're you are under attack, you have a threat nearby. Your body will never, and your brain will never allow you to go to the deep sleep because there's a close enough threat that you should never be in a deep sleep or REM sleep 
because you have to be aware of the threat and your threat is stress. Therefore, when you are not eating right, when you're overtraining, under eating, you're already under that much stress. Even if you had 15 hours a day to sleep, you would sleep because you're so exhausted, but you wouldn't get the repair, repair in the body that's necessary that happens, like you said, the, 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 the hormone release and all of the things that happen when we're in deep sleep and in REM. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, sleep is just such a non-negotiable and quality absolutely. sleep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we've talked about sleep being one of your, your um, tools that you took out, yeah. helping with your hormones as well. What other tools did you need in order to get out of burnout? So I allowed myself to binge on the healthy stuff. I mentioned that yeah. a little bit earlier. So that was one of the things is deprivation and restriction never work, right? This is why diets don't work. You feel deprived, you feel restricted, you feel like you're failing if you don't do it to a T. So I told myself, all right, Lex, you've binged on unhealthy food enough. Now you can binge, but you can only binge on things that are at home. And I would never bring anything unhealthy at home. Mm -hmm. So a couple of things that happened there. For one, I had enough time to put some body fat back on the body, which your body is going to do that really quickly because it's trying to get to the yeah. body uh, ideal weight. And two, the foods now that I was eating, that I was binging on the healthy foods, don't have the same reaction that processed foods do, which it doesn't create the addiction. It actually satisfies me. I have enough water and fiber and enough chewing to do with that food so that I cannot overeat to the level I can with sweets, for example. And so that calmed me down. And then, of course, meditation and really diving into how the brain works, because I was trying to figure out how the brain works, too, because like I knew I had willpower. I knew I had um all that I needed, but I couldn't calm myself down. So looking into my own thoughts, looking into the emotional, digging into why did I continue competing, right? Why do I want to continue? Do I want to, right? And then tweaking that to what would be the optimal thing for me? How would I actually feel at my best in all areas of my life? And that has to do with self-care. And that's the mental and emotional aspect of it. And then the physical, the sleep, the hydration, nutrition, and all those, and training, of course, the training changed too. Yeah. So the training changed. Um, you did say something to me that hit me when we were talking earlier. And I really want to bring this point up is that you were afraid to push your body again at one point. Yeah. And that hit me because it's been the same for me. And I had a lot of gut issues and my gut would stop me from working out too. I couldn't do like I was if I did push my body too much, it's almost like my, my gut would be like, oh, nope, that was too much. <laughs> you yeah. got to run to the washroom again. And like, I couldn't, I couldn't at a point. Um, I know after my burnout as well, I hired friends to train me because I couldn't push a weight. So it was even like a small weight. Yeah. I would describe it as if still feeling like I was pushing through a fog of cement. So yeah. it didn't matter if it was three pounds, five pounds for arms like these little small weights for me, I could, like you it couldn't. took forever to get it high because I felt like almost somebody was pushing my hand down as I was pushing up. Yeah, and that again has to do with your body communicating with you and actually low body fat leads to weakness. We need body fat to have strength. Yeah. And there's no better feeling than feeling strong, feeling weak, like nobody wants to feel weak. Like majority of women will be like, oh, I want to lose all weight. I want to look skinny. No, you don't. If you're feeling weak, you yeah. don't want that. You actually, what you're searching for is feeling better about yourself and you're wanting to feel strong and empowered. Yeah. And when we're feeling like we weigh, the way you're describing we were feeling, it's like, first of all, mentally it hits you because you're like, I used to use bigger weights. What the hell is this, right? right. Like you're like, what, what am I, a grandma? Yeah. But you cannot, you cannot. And so it mentally hits you and it hits you, of course, emotionally because those two are connected. And then physically, you just can't because your body is just trying to get back on some form of balance. And it's trying to tell you, we're way out of whack. We need to work on other things and, and settle things in our head. Um, and another note on, on gut, it, the gut is so sensitive. So for those who don't know, your gut health is everything. Most of serotonin in your body comes from your gut, which is your 90%. happiness, 90%, your happiness hormone and your immune system starts in your gut. So for those who have gut issues, I would first address that. Like there's other, there's so many things nowadays that people can do, but it's 
so important to fix gut health and get it under control mm -hmm. um, through probiotics, prebiotics, but not, you know, re regular stuff, ideally, the natural fermented foods through, okay. you know, meditation works, um, you know, aligning the energy centers, all of those things work. And how we feel when we eat actually has a lot to do with how we're going to digest. So there's a lot to look into, but one has to be willing to dig and get the answers for the optimal self. Because if you don't have your mental, emotional, physical, and even spiritual health, you got nothing. Like you, what, what, what's there? Mental yeah. health comes first and mental depends on all of these other things we talked about. Yeah, I want to, just what you just said needs to be repeated. So your gut is responsible for 90% of your serotonin. That's your happy, feel good. I'm engaged, socially engaged with people hormone. Yes. 90%. And the thing is, is once we start getting some gas, once we get like a little bloating or a little heartburn or an adjustment, we think, oh, we're good. We're fine. It's quite often only once we reach like the IBS, the really like I'm even when we're tracking where all the bathrooms are or we're not going for days and it's totally painful. We may not even realize the impact that that's having on our stress levels and how much our body can't be absorbing nutrients on how much it can't be the 50 hormones that our stress system is in charge of. Most of those are released through our gut that we need to make sure that, um, that once you start having bloating and gas, that is a sign. We need to know these early signs that are, yes. our, our body's stress. So if you have gas or bloating and you're listening to this, if you have some heartburn, that is a sign that your gut needs some tending to and your stress system needs some help. And as you said, sleep, gut, and my third one is nervous system. Oh, those absolutely. Like huge part with each other that if you make sure that those three are in check, then like your body can fight so yes. much more. You have way more reserves for stress. Your, your, your body is doing what it needs to do and you're happier, you're calmer, you're less stressed. And, and that, that extends into like worse burnout down yeah. the road. So, and the you know, I'm, I'm so glad you said that because, you know, I, I tell my husband, I'm like, you know, people joke that women don't have gas. And I'm like, I don't have gas. Like quite literally, if I get bloated or if I get something, I'm like, what did I eat? When did I eat it? What was in it? I start questioning everything because it's not normal for my body. And you have to know your body. You have to question what you've been eating, how you've been feeling when you've been eating. It's so important to do that. Yeah. And another thing I want to mention is the difference between serotonin and dopamine, right? So serotonin is the true happiness where I feel, like you said, social and just feel feeling good in life. Dopamine is, we get dopamine highs when we look on the social media and we scroll. And that's why these companies want us on social media. And dopamine is highly addictive. And I just Absolutely. wanted to make that distinction because sometimes people can say, well, I feel good. You know, I'm, I, I feel good. You know, I, I don't necessarily think it's serotonin. There is both hormones can look similar in how you feel, but it's a very interesting distinction between the two because serotonin is when you truly feel happy and fulfilled and warm inside dopamine is getting a hit of feeling high for a moment and then it goes away yeah a great analogy i've heard on that is it's from one of my kids podcasts which was hilarious on cell phones and it was talking about a dog wanting treats yep. and it's the same so every time a dog sees you going near the treat jar they get a hit of dopamine and they're like oh ready want a treat want a treat and they're all excited they get the treat treats done they're like i want another right yeah. so it's dopamine keeps getting you that hit so all the likes all the scrolls all the you know i'm just going to read one more or for somebody that's even in a major stress spiral where they are so fight or flight and need to comment on everybody's post which i used to do when i was in burnout and you see these people that are constantly commenting on everyone's post but it's like i need to post another i need to comment on somebody else i need to keep commenting or i need to check one more or scroll through a few more that's all dopamine and dopamine is creating the habit so how you train dogs to do certain tricks is by constantly giving them that dopamine hit so yeah dopamine is for the habit it's not the one that gives you the joy so you may feel the loss of joy in things things may not excite you as much outside of the things that give you the dopamine hit 
Yeah, great way to put it. And it's true, it's the likes, it's the shares, and all of that boils down to mental health. And it connects to what we were talking about is because, again, when you want success in something, you can, you know, you can give it all or nothing, but you got to be very aware of what, what that means for you, your body and your well being, right? So when it comes to competing, or when it comes to social media growth, right, like with the popularity, people want that, at what cost does it come? Right. For example, I have a four year old at the time that this is getting out. My my son is four years old and I tell people I really balance my work and my personal life and I am willing to slow down the progress in my business for the sake of being around my kid, which means I'm living according to my values. Well, what we're talking about also doesn't go with our values because we wanted something. We wanted the reward. We wanted that dopamine hit when we step on that stage but we weren't evaluating does this actually align with my values does this actually contribute to my lifestyle and like you said you have no life and i remember hearing this and i was so proud of that like yeah sure i don't need the social stuff i got my little container with my food and i'm so proud because i'm the what is the cost there's always the good and the bad and sometimes a very ugly side of things so whatever you decide to do with your body, with your mind, with your dopamine, serotonin, with your gut, you have to ask yourself, is this adding value to my life? And is this according to my values? Or is this actually taking me away from things that I value in my life? Yeah, absolutely. And and I'm so on board with you on this. And it's really hard. I will. Um, I know for those that are listening, they may know, like, I out of necessity, had to homeschool one of my kids. My other one now is feeling FOMO because it's so cool that he might hop on board next year. But I had to move my business to part-time. I had to skim things down. And I did that for my children. But it's fascinating because the things that I skimmed down, I realized I didn't need because my business is still in the same spot, even though I took half the stuff away. I took the busy work away. So, and, and that's the thing where... Like with so many different careers and jobs, if you stop and look at that values list, and that's huge, I would encourage anybody listening. So this would be the homework that I would love anybody that's listening to this today is to go online and search for a values list and hundreds of values will pop up. Find your top five and ask yourself, am I living to these values? Like we may think that we are, And there's one thing as well, where family comes to the top of so many people's values. But then I'm going to ask you now, if you look at your calendar, go look at your calendar and tell me, since family is one of your top values, is that what your calendar shows me? Is that what your bank account shows me? Mm -hmm. Like if your bank account is showing me that all of your money and your time and everything is going into your job and your business and to, to not being able to like even have meals with your family. So you're rushing for takeout and all of these things, which takeout's fine once in a while and doing all that. But if it's because you're rushing so much and you have zero time and you you can't have that time with your family, then are you living up to your values? I've had guys as well that were always saying yes to all of the overtime um, because they felt bad because they knew the other guys were burning out on shift. And when I stopped and had them think about it, compared to their family, like when there's a cost, when you say yes, what are you saying no to? And they're like, shit, I'm cheating on my wife with their fire truck's name. Yeah. Fire truck has taken over and they're not looking at their values and their priorities. So that is, that's huge. And that's a huge takeaway that I want everybody to really go back and listen to this. If they need to rewind back a little bit to where Vax was talking about, um, She was talking about values and really looking into your values. That was so good that you did that. Like, I like that that should be a takeaway, the homework. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people don't even know what the values are. And I love what you said, open it up and don't go just to one website, go to different websites and find out what people consider values and then prioritize, list them all, pick three or five, prioritize them, and then look into your calendar, like you said, 
And if it hasn't been done so far, start slowly implementing things in place. And for example, you hear a lot of, especially women say, you know, when I'm working, I feel guilty that I'm not with my kid or kids. And when I'm with my kids, I'm feeling guilty that I'm not working. And it becomes a catch 22. Be present by living with your values and limiting your time that you are having, like you said, limiting your time that you have on your job actually made you more focused because it was like, I don't have time to BS around. I got to sit down and finish these top three things. And then I got to go do my other things. Yes. And that's what made you feel good because you're moving forward. You're not just shuffling papers around the office. You're getting things done and you're present. So when you're working, you're working. And when you're with your kids, you're with your kids. And it's the catch 22 that I would love everybody to get out of and actually learn to be present. Because by nature, I love what I do. And I could, I could work 20 hour days because I'm like, oh, I love this. This is not even work. But then again, what is the cost of it? And as an adult, logically it makes it it's easier to work than to play with a four-year-old because if playing with four-year-old actually requires me to step out of what i consider important right now and i caught myself doing this like my kid would be playing with the little cars or whatnot and i go to the kitchen get water i'm like oh what should we cook and i start thinking and i'm like no 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 I got to be present with him right now because this is important to him. And because he's that important to me, this needs to be important to me too. So we all have stages where we have to relearn or teach ourselves how to be present, how to do these things. But when you start doing that and you align your life to live according to your values and you look into your time and say, am I investing my time wisely or am I spending or wasting my time? everything changes that's when you start getting that serotonin rather than dopamine hit that's when you start and all of that by nature will make you want to train in the best way for your body will make you want to eat in the best way for your body because everything becomes about how do i optimize all the areas of my life i love yeah. it you'll find as well that if you're sitting on the couch scrolling on your phone and your kids are beside you, you're like oh yep no i'm I, you'll stop scrolling more to be with your kids. Yeah. And so for example, as well with homeschooling my child and working in my business, he, his birthday is coming up and we need to make him a cake and he helps me with that. So I had podcast interviews booked today from 1130 on until two to three o'clock today when I have to do it, go pick up my other son from school. So I had four hours, about three and a half is what I have of solid work that I know needs to be there with a break in between some interviews. So this morning we went and got the ingredients for his, um, we got the ingredients. We went and did our jog around the block. We threw a Frisbee for a little bit. So we made sure that we had that time together. And I told him like the day before I'll say, okay, tomorrow I'm working at this time. I'm not working during this time. What do you want to do? So he also knows where that barriers so I don't have the guilt of being in the office because I already know that he knows where my time is if I'm working in the mornings which is quite often I do work in the mornings for a couple of hours I'm like we go for a jog we do our breathing together we talk about his day he's good he's set up I go to the office he knows when I'm coming out and, and look how much more present that makes everybody be when I'm not guilty in the office, I get no. stuff done. And when I know I only have a certain amount of time, I make sure the priorities are getting done instead of going on Facebook, scrolling around, emailing people and doing all the, the, the busy work, Busy work. Yes. I'm doing the priorities and Absolutely. it makes such a difference on, on my productivity in the office and my time <sighs> with my kids and my other son's feeling FOMO, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah home with you guys. I want to yeah. be doing fun things. We go to coffee shops. So we'll walk to go to a coffee shop to work and we're still spending time together, but we're at the coffee shop and we're both working and then we yeah. walk home. So we get activity too, and breaks in between on our screens. And, and it's so good because now you're living according to values and it changes the value of your work. Like yeah. you said, when you're with him, you're present. When you're working, you're present. And it's so powerful to do that because it changed the way you train too. Like it, for me, it changed the way I work out because now I know I have 15 minutes. How can I use this in the best amount of my time? Like, how can I invest this time the best? You know, if I'm with him, same thing, like what constantly challenging my thoughts to say, am I using this to the best of my ability? Am I giving him what he needs? Am I getting the most out of this as well? And it's just, it makes everything better. 
And like I said, that automatically makes you want to eat better. And I love how you make him um, cook with you because my son does the same thing. And it, they get involved. Now it's more time together. Now it's talking nutrition. Now it's building something together. And food is primal for people. You know, for millions of years, food is what gets people together. So it's very- works in your value system. Yeah, It's exactly. all in your value system there too. And yeah, it's just absolutely amazing. Love it. Let's, this has been such a good episode. I do want to dive into, we, we did talk about it a bit, but I just want to touch on it one more time before we do have to go is that feeling of being afraid to work out again, that feeling of like, I know for me, it happened for many years. I know my gut, this is where we segued yeah. into gut and stuff. My gut did get in the way, but also I had mental fear of my body crashing like that again. And so I have been afraid to get back on it, which is where um, I know my audience knows I wear a whoop band, I have the aura and the whoop because I use them with my clients. But having that actual data, that tracker of knowing, how much my body's recovering after my workouts and knowing how much more I can push the next day has helped me, but not enough still that I had to work through that in a therapy session mm -hmm. where we were diving into, cause it became a trauma for me. And we think of traumas as quite often these big traumas, but my identity was taken away being yeah. healthy, being fit, being in a gym, being the strongest girl in the gym, the one where all the guys were like, holy shit, see how much yeah. she pressed or how much she just like leg pressed or bench pressed. I loved that. And <laughs> that's maybe an ego thing, but that was all taken away from me, yeah. all of it. And I was afraid of how far I could push to get back that yes, the whoop has been instrumental in helping me with that, but I still was so afraid that I wouldn't still push to my potential. Yeah. And I had to work through that in a therapy session to work through that trauma. Yeah. For you, so, you done. So for me, I mentioned that I dove into self-improvement, into neurohacking, into biohacking, into all of that. And that played a crucial role in how it helped me through it. So understanding that the fear is real and it's natural after having something like that happen. But I also dove into nutrition and the thyroid health and hormones as well. So I actually, which I don't recommend anybody listening to this do, but I weeded myself slowly off of thyroid medication while increasing iodine intake while evaluating constantly how I'm feeling until I got to a point where I didn't need the medication anymore. I was functioning just fine. Once again, not recommending, do not do at home by, by yourself, but I you did. Know, always check with your doctor. Before always you check with your doctor. Anything. Yeah, all that stuff. I'm not taking responsibility for this. Um, but that's what I did. And I supplemented with iodine. I actually backed away from going to the gym. Um, because like you said, it's ego driven, but it was also embarrassing to go back to the gym and just lift like baby yes. weights. And so I, I at the time had the studio, so I would train a little bit at the studio. But one smart thing that I actually did is say, you know what? I'm going to give my body what it needs rather than what I think I want. And so it took me a while to, I even chart, changed the workouts and I, I watched my body change, right? That that's the hard mentally part. Cause you're like, oh my God, what's happening here. But I, I made sure that I was okay with that in order to get myself back on track because I knew through all my research and I, the things that I studied that brain work, mental health over everything, right? And the mental effects, the emotional and so on. And so then I slowly got back into running, which was completely different for whatever I was doing before. Um, I, um, at that time in my life, I ended up selling the business because of the burnout whenever, like I, it was just like, I'm just lost passion for all of this. I didn't want to be, I think part of it was just not wanting to be in the fitness space anymore. And so I moved to Europe and I took some time off and, and then, and then even I started training slightly back when I was still pregnant with my son, backed off after he was a baby, started going running. So it was like a, a, a testing process for me to slowly tiptoe my way back. 
And then also going back to the values, for example, I'm still doing different types of workouts. I work, uh, I do functional training now, a lot of HIIT training, things like that. That is how I used to train my clients, but it's not how I used to train because I know the benefits of them and it's still not my favorite thing to do, but I feel the best right now doing it. And to connect it to the values is I know that the time right now that I'm spending with my son is more valuable to me than spending that hour at the gym at this point in time. So I know that the results I'm getting, I, I can go according to what I'm doing and I'm okay with that. And I'm okay for paying that small price in the way that maybe, maybe my body's not exactly where I want it to be, but I'm very close to it because my time is used differently. But then looking into, like you said, you're spending activity time with your son. So I started at 5.30 every evening going for a run with him or he is riding a bike or doing something. And I made myself a non-negotiable deal to do an activity every day for minimum of 15 minutes. Yeah. So some days that means just score. Some days it's actually running. It's very different on different days. And um, excitingly so, we're about to move to a different location where they have a full-blown gym and I'm actually going to take my son there as well so that we can actually start working there a little bit more and I can step into connecting the values, right? Like spending time with my son, teaching him something that I believe is crucially important and also getting the results in a different way. So I think the journey is different for everybody, but I think you, you really have to look into mental, emotional, physical, and even spiritual and really slowly work on how to balance all of them out. Cause I did go for a while real deep into spirituality and into meditation and visualization and all those things. And they have a place, but it, you cannot not work on the other things. So I find that working slowly in balancing all of them is the best way for me. Absolutely. And that is for everybody. It's just how you work each one, which ones you focus on is really depends on where somebody needs at that point in time. Absolutely. And looking into your time and determining when, like, I'm big on telling people like, just that's an excuse. That's a story. Cause we all do it. We can, oh, I don't have time to meditate. Really? Do you have 60 seconds before you fall asleep? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can do 60 well, you're seconds. Eight, Making eight, it eight, so eight, stupidly eight. small. Yeah, make it so stupidly small that you can actually fit it in your schedule because once you start getting the benefits of it, you're going to want to do a little bit more of it, right? Mm -hmm. Like I have a routine of 50 or 10 minutes of foam rolling every night. The only time that I found it good for me to do is when my son is, has fallen asleep, I'm listening to my audiobook, and then I'm foam rolling for 10 minutes at the same time. So you can find time based on your values mm -hmm. if you're willing to do the work to align yourself with your values. But honestly, that's what life is about is living according to your values because that makes you feel amazing. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, this has been such such a great um, chat today. One that everybody really definitely needs to hear. Um, we do have all of your links. I'll put them in the show notes. If you could just let people know the best place that they could reach you as well for anybody listening, if they wanna do a quick check without going to the show notes, where can they find you? Yeah, I've been uh, really working on my TikTok game. So my TikTok is at Lex Vuko, L-E-K-S-V-U-C-K-O. Um, I'm also on Facebook. I I am on Instagram, but not really, but you can find me there too. I do check all my messages and make sure I reply to everybody. So feel free to friend me on Facebook, reach out. It's always my name, Lex Vuko, um, on all the social medias. I'm also on LinkedIn. They can find me there as well. Amazing. And I will put all of those links. I've got them all. So I'll put them all awesome. in the show notes as well. So before we go, do you have, if you were to tell somebody in burnout, some piece of advice that they could take with them right now, what, like, what would you say to them to help them know they're going to be okay? Well, first I would say, don't wait for yourself to identify with the word burnout, because it's yeah. gonna be way past the point of easy return back, right? So don't even wait for the word to burn out to pop into your head to wait for yourself to admit that. Start looking into physical, uh, mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual, and even financial areas of your life, and start looking into which ones you've been focusing more on, or, and which ones have you been focusing on less, and start evaluating that. What you gave as homework is perfect. I would say be very clear on your values 
and then start slowly setting up your life according to your values. But I think we've stressed out very much early on when we were talked about food is nothing drastic, no restrictions, deprivations, and nothing drastic will ever work. So if you're trying to implement the values into your life, don't go drastic, right? Your brain doesn't like drastic stuff. If you're trying to change anything, don't go drastic. Start with really, really, really tiny things that you know you need to implement in your life that you can stick with. One of the things I do with my clients is I ask them when you're setting a goal, ask yourself, can I do this indefinitely, right? Oh, I'm going to work out five days a week for one hour. No, you're not. Can you do that indefinitely? Well, I can do that maybe next week. Well, what can you do? Can you do 10 minutes three times a week? Yeah, I can do that. Okay, great. Now let's put it on, on the calendar and then you just execute. So don't wait for the word burnout, just evaluate how you're feeling. If you're not feeling optimal in one area of your life, they're connected to all the others. Be willing to be perfectly honest with yourself, right? I have a video that I say that we have the good, we have the bad, and we do have the ugly. And you have to be willing to look into all of them to be perfectly honest with yourself to say, okay, something's not working here. Let me start digging into myself mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, financially, and figure out what am I lacking? Where am I lacking? Why am I lacking? So I think on perfect honesty, willingness to dig deep within how I'm feeling and thinking is the starting point because that raises awareness. And once we have awareness, we can start changing our behaviors. Yeah, that was amazing. I love that. Thank you. All right. So we will end on that note. That was absolutely amazing. If you want to reach out to Lex, um, go to the show notes. All of her links are there. You can follow her, like, give her a shout out. Absolutely. And we will see you in the next episode where we are, we have so many amazing interviews that are set up as well. So keep an eye out there again in the show notes as well are my links for my first responder work with 911lifestyle.com or um, all of my other work with other people in burnout, which is burnoutexpert.ca. Thank you, everyone. And we will see you in the next episode. Bye.